So joining us on India Business Hour, I'm Shireen Bhan. Straight to the macro data, India's trade gap has narrowed to a five-month low of just below $14 billion in September. The fall in deficit has ignited a recovery in the rupee, which closed at 73.83 after falling to a low of 74.04 before the numbers. Exports have actually fallen by 2.5% year-on-year, but imports have risen modestly by just 10.5%, leading to the fall in the deficit. Lata here now with more. So Lata, certainly relief and good news. It's glorious good news. Uh, this number, uh, the market was <laughs> not very sure because the detailed numbers are not available. But uh, this can ignite a rally in the rupee t and take it all the way to 73, 72. It's a very big number because it was the trade deficit of 17.4 uh, billion of uh, August and 18 billion of July, which caused the fall in the rupee because it is at that run rate of 18 billion, we would have ended up with a current account deficit of almost 3% of the GDP. That's a Lakshman Rekha. If crossed, it becomes, uh, you know, almost uh, unsustainable. But uh, if you're going to go at a run rate of 14 or 15 billion, as the September trade deficit seems to indicate, then we are well within our normal number of about 2.5, 2.6. So a massive rally in the rupee is waiting to happen. It's just that the granular data was not available by the time the market closed. But the three important things that caused the imports to fall uh, was known to the market at the press uh, conference. One, that uh, uh, gold imports had fallen by about 1 billion compared to August. It's 10.9 compared to 11.8 billion in the previous uh, month. Uh, uh, sorry, that's oil uh, f falling from 11.8 to 10.9. Gold fell from 3.6 to about 2.5 billion. And consumer electronics, which one was hoping would be the other one which will be affected by the expensive uh, 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 dollar, did not fall. So that is the disappointment for the market. One would have thought that that is how the trade deficit would go down. That expensive consumer electronics, which are just consumer goods, ought to fall, but that didn't fall. That seems to have risen. No, we don't have more data than that. The other problem that the uh, uh, economists will have is September tends to be an outlier month. Last year, September saw an unusual jump in exports and they went to 28 billion. That is why September on September, you're seeing a fall in exports. Now, that doesn't sit very comfortably. We will have to wait and see whether the uh, expensive dollar also or the cheap rupee also means our exports should grow. Why is the export number exactly what it was in August? It should have done better. That's not happened. These are minor discomforts that the market will have and it will want the granular detail. It, we will be much happier, of course, if the experience in September gets repeated in October. But this evidence is enough for the market to trigger a bigger rally in the rupee tomorrow. All right, Lata, thanks very much. So uh, relief coming in there on the trade deficit front. On to the large street where markets were on a buy on dips mode with most indices ending near high points of the day. The Nifty and the Sensex gained two-fifths of a percent with the Nifty managing to reclaim the 10,500 mark. Banks underperformed the index with a slight negative bias. Mid-caps outperformed with uh, the mid-cap index rallying about a percent, ending above 16,000. 900. And in the commodity space, crude oil prices have eased. This after U.S. President Donald Trump's statement over the disappearance of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Addressing the media a short while ago, Trump said that Saudi Arabia's King Salman had denied knowledge of anything regarding the journalist's fate. He added, and I quote, King Salman's denial to me could not have been stronger, end of quote. Trump has also suggested that rogue killers might have murdered the journalist who was in Turkey. Take a listen. The king firmly denied any knowledge of it. He didn't really know. Maybe, I, I don't want to get into his mind, but it sounded to me like maybe these could have been rogue killers. Who knows? We're going to try getting to the bottom of it very soon. But his was a flat denial. We had no deal with Turkey. We don't make deal, any deals for hostages or prisoners. But I will tell you that I feel much differently about Turkey today than I felt about them two days ago. 
Well, that's President Trump, and that statement has had an impact on crude prices. Now, back home, top global oil CEOs are in India. They met Prime Minister Modi, officials from the World Bank, the International Energy Forum, also part of that meeting, along with top executives of the Indian oil and gas industry. Now, according to a statement that was released after the meeting, the Prime Minister has asked global CEOs to review the current payment mechanism to help provide relief to a weakening rupee. He's also called on global oil majors to invest in exploration in India and made a strong case for a partnership between producers and consumers. Manisha Gupta spoke with BP CEO Bob Dudley exclusively after his meeting with the Prime Minister. Dudley says oil prices are currently way higher for the entire world. He predicted that prices will eventually ease to about $60 to $65 a barrel in the long term because that's why he believes prices should be fundamentally, but he does not expect that drop to be immediate or in the near future. Take a listen. You know, there, there does seem to be some desperation, some frustration now with the crude oil prices running up. The payment terms need to be worked up on the currency, the way it has been moving as well. So uh, how valid do you see those as concerns right now? Would you say it is short term or is it going to spill over? Well, I think, I think the world oil prices are way off the fairway of what's right for the world and comfortable. So they're very high now in countries like India, and I'll, I'll just name another big country, not as big, but Turkey, for example, all import almost all of its fuel is very painful and then you have the strengthening of the dollar and the, and the impact on the rupees so to at the pump it's it's higher than it's probably ever been in in, in India uh, so the concerns here are how long this will last I always go back to the fundamentals of a market supply and demand take away some short-term geopolitics here the supply and the demand uh, should should keep an oil price, I think, you know, 60, 65 is what we'll see. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to be tomorrow, I think. It's going to take some time. There are mm -hmm. places in the world that are bottleneck with oil production. The United States is one. There's a famous place called the Permian. Canada's oil is bottleneck. There are other sources that could come on, as well as what Saudi Arabia and the OPEC countries do, but it won't be overnight. I mm. have to ask you about the technology disruptions and also the electric vehicles. Uh, there is lots happening in the sense of transition. How do you look at the conventional oil and then, of course, these new disruptions? Room for all of it. Electric vehicles are, are probably simply not going to change as much as people are assuming overnight. I mean, if you burn coal to produce the electricity that makes an electric vehicle, that's not changing oil demand. And I think um, they'll have less impact. It's great for the cities, particularly. We're absolutely supportive of electric cars and vehicles, and we'll be working, hopefully, bringing some of what we're doing, mobility with reliance and retailing. Um, but that's not what I'm, I, I would worry about. I'm fully supportive of them, but it's not that kind of a not dial changer. What, what really has been the conversation with Reliance, the fuel retail space, uh, where do you see the way it is? Well, we want to we want to get it right. We uh, Our teams have spent uh, a lot of time together. Uh, it's always a matter of pacing, but this is not something for overnight. When you go into uh, partnerships like this, it's decades and decades and decades. So uh, sure. our, our partnership with Reliance is great. We just got to get the right sort of terms here with with retailing I'm, I'm take great comfort from this meeting the not price controls on retailing because that's that's really makes it difficult so I'm, I'm I'm optimistic well that was BP's global CEO Bob Dudley and he was not alone in talking about the fuel retailing opportunity in India Saudi Arabia's Minister for Energy Khalid Ali Fali who's also the chairman of the oil and gas giant Saudi Aramco expressed the company's interest in fuel retailing in India he also spoke about Saudi Arabia's contribution to keep crude oil prices under Check. That's what they believe they've been able to do, given the concerns arising out of disruption because of the Iranian sanctions. Listen in. Saudi Aramco's desire is also to invest in consumer-facing segments, such as retail fuels and petrochemicals. We went out of our way to alleviate anxiety over supply shortfalls and at the risk of accusations of reversing our production policy, we decided to increase production at last June's OPEC meeting to ensure there were indeed no supply shortages. This has averted a major price escalation.
Well, that's the Saudi take on crude oil prices and more on the fuel retailing opportunity in India. And this is a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. The government has now decided to set up a five-member panel to review the rules that govern fuel retailing in India. The review is being undertaken in order to attract more private sector participation. Anshu joins us now with the exclusive details. Anshu, you know, we saw private sector players get into the business and then get out of the business. What is this panel's mandate? What exactly do they intend to do? Well, at a time when a lot of foreign companies are looking to enter into fuel retail business in India, we understand from government sources that government is looking to set up a committee of five members uh, uh, which will be headed by Kirit Parikh, which will look at uh, uh, reviewing the current uh, existing guidelines uh, for marketing fuel retail in uh, India. Now, we understand that this committee will submit its uh, report uh, within 60 days. And the idea is to identify entry barriers for expansion of fuel retail business in India by the private companies as well as uh, look, look at the need if required to uh, liberalize uh, guidelines for uh, fuel retail business in India to increase private sector investment uh, in retail business of fuel. Now we understand that BP along with RIL, uh, Nayara Energy led by Rosneft, uh, Saudi Aramco are few companies which are looking at entering or expanding their current uh, retail business of fuel. Now please remember that uh, Indian Oil Corporation has 50% of market share in retail business of uh, fuel retail and uh, HPCL and BPCL have 25% market share. Now the total uh, retail outlets in India is close to 62,000 in India and private sector only consists of about 6,500. So any changes in the guidelines or rules for uh, um, for ensuring that there's investment in India uh, in this segment will be welcomed by a lot of companies. Back to you. Thanks, Anshu. The biggest deterrent for private sector players uh, in the fuel retail business is price control. So if the government expresses very clearly its intent not to go back to an era of regulated prices, there may be takers. But the deadline for payment companies to comply with RBI's data localization norms comes to an end today. Remember, in April this year, the Reserve Bank had directed all payment companies to set up an ecosystem to store transaction data of Indian citizens in India. And while the RBI has ruled out giving any extension on compliance, many payment companies companies have complained that the six-month compliance window was just too short. Kevin Lee joins us now. Kevin, clock is ticking for payment companies. Take us through the unanswered questions that still remain. Well, absolutely. Our first unanswered question is what happens to companies who haven't complied? Big card companies like MasterCard, Visa, American Express are yet to report compliance and the RBI has made it clear that it doesn't want customers to suffer. So it's likely that these payment companies will continue to function but might be fined for non-compliance. Reports suggest that US-based companies have asked the central bank for another 12 months to comply. Secondly, the RBI has asked companies to get auditors to submit compliance certificates by December. But how will these auditors know if companies are exclusively storing data in India? Do they have jurisdiction to check if copies of this data is present in other countries as well? And what about the middlemen? If I buy something on an Alibaba with my Visa card, then sure, Visa has been mandated to store the transaction data in India. But what about Alibaba and other e-commerce sites? Does the data that they collect from me constitute payment data? And the last and perhaps most important question, is data storage really as simple as we are making it seem? Data is often fragmented, different parts of data are often stored in different locations. And what's more, companies have backup copies of this data in case the primary source gets corrupted. Does limiting data to just one set of servers in one country go against the best practices of cybersecurity? Also, data isn't always breached at its physical source. Most cyber attacks take place on websites when the data is being transmitted through the internet. How does data localization prevent that? Now, that's a summary of some of the unanswered questions still lingering. Uh, yes, we're in compliance. We actually informed the RBI a couple of weeks back that we've completed 100% localization. I think um, for us, it was more just about putting the sort of people on the ground on making sure each of the systems were fully localized. Um, it's fair to say that we were all already about 90% there because we are an India-centric player. Uh, so all our infrastructure, all our data centers were already yeah. in India to begin with. But we had to bring all the, all the uh, service providers and others into the net.
We process about 20 lakh transactions on a daily basis and these are largely online payment transactions. For us, it's been relatively easy because as a company, which we are a homegrown, India-grown uh, business, so our entire platform set uh, was in India. So yeah. very little challenges in terms of getting the localization um, you know, tick mark. I guess what is important is you got to understand where RBI is coming from, right? What RBI is saying is, I need to have supervisory access, that's point one. Second, they are saying that I need to protect the data. And something which they are not saying, but is really underlying to all of this is, I want to protect the payment systems of the country. The actual verification may in fact cause some challenges because when data is stored on a cloud system, verifying the uh, exact location of the data becomes a challenge. But otherwise, legally, there are no impediments for auditors to do this verification. Once a payment system is registered with the RBI, they've subjected themselves to the regulation and they will have to comply with all the guidelines mm. and the follow out mm. that comes through that. Therefore, the auditors would be fully within their rights to do this, to do the verification process and RBI will be fully within its rights to then take okay. action for violation. Any company which has to now comply will have four stages. The first stage where we'll do a map gap and find out what is the state of compliance or non-compliance, how much data are they storing locally, and what parts of it are, are they outside the country. Once you get that, they'll have to do a data localization architecture review and see how can they get the data back in this country. The third part okay. would be implement the local data in-country systems. And once all that has been checked and reviewed by auditors, then give a compliance certificate to the RBI saying, hey guys, we have done whatever it takes and we are compliant. After calling allegations of sexual harassment fabricated and refusing to step down as the Minister of State for External Affairs, MJ, MJ Akbar is on the offensive. 14 women journalists accusing the former editor turned politician of sexual misconduct and Akbar has singled out the first journalist to level the allegations against him, Priya Ramani. He has filed a criminal defamation case against Ramani and in his petition, Akbar claims Ramani resorted to a serious series of maliciously fabricated allegations to create a false narrative. He goes on to say, and I quote, the scandalous allegations have affected his reputation in the community, unquote. The petition will be heard tomorrow. Priya Ramani has responded. Uh, she has put out a statement, and I quote, by instituting a case of criminal defamation against me, Mr. Akbar has made his stand clear. Rather than engage with the serious allegations that many women have made against him, he seeks to silence them through intimidation and harassment, end of quote. She then goes on to say, and I quote again, needless to say, I'm ready to fight allegations of defamation laid against me as truth and the absolute truth is my only defense. To take the conversation forward, senior lawyer Suja Kantavala, diplomatic affairs editor of the Hindu Sumasti Heather, editorial director of the Business Standard, A.K. Bhattacharya, and senior journalist Sandhya Menon are here with us. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, AKB, you know, I want to first address this issue and I've heard this in conversations through the day, in fact, over the last 24, 48 hours saying, why hasn't the government taken a position? Why hasn't the government taken a stance? I find that odd because MJ Akbar continues to be Minister of State for External Affairs. There is no probe, there is no inquiry, there is no investigation that has been ordered against him. Uh, he has not been asked to resign. He continues in his position. That is the government stand. Well, you are right uh, in that sense. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Akbar has uh, every right uh, to defend himself. Uh, these are all charges. But I think the ball is in the government's court here, really. That whether the government wishes uh, to respond to these charges uh, and uh, discuss these issues internally uh, and uh, take a position on whether it wants to have uh, somebody in its council of ministers who has been accused uh, of uh, such charges. You know, internationally, uh, uh, whenever uh, ministers or uh, senators uh, are accused of these charges, even before they are actually fought out in a court of law, yeah. uh, the ministers or the senators yes. themselves 
uh, consider it necessary that they, 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 mm. they, they step down. Now, in this case, uh, I think, as I said, that Mr. Akbar has every right to defend himself, but the government uh, has to decide for itself yes. whether uh, it uh, needs to act uh, uh, here or not. So, Hassani Heather, let me come to you. There has not been a single response from the government. No spokesperson was willing to join our program this evening. We tried every single one of them. The response was no, we're not available. Uh, no response from the Prime Minister's office officially. No response from the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, the, the, the message seems to be this is his personal matter. He will deal with it personally. How odd is that position when this is a sitting minister, he is a member of the Council of Ministers and the government refuses to acknowledge uh, the accounts that have been put forward by 14 individuals? Well, absolutely, Shireen. That is a question we've been asking the Ministry of External Affairs, remember, for more than a week now when Mr. Akbar was traveling in Africa and apparently couldn't call his visit off in order to deal with these uh, accusations. And, and you're quite right when you say that the government, by simply saying nothing and allowing him to make his defense, is essentially saying that they, uh, they don't see a problem with him continuing in office while he fights these charges. But we do have to remember that to begin with, Mr. Akbar is a public official, he's a powerful man, he's a, uh, in the, uh, he's a minister. Uh, the second point really being that he represents yeah. India. So he's not just a minister, but he's a minister in the Ministry of External Affairs and he represents India around the world. And what the government does or chooses to do in the next few weeks, in the next few days almost, uh, is really representative not just of what they're doing in this one case, but how it, it expects to deal with sexual oh, harassment oh. in the workplace, which is not just an Indian phenomenon. It is a global issue which many countries are seized with right now. Yeah. Absolutely. And let me take that point across to Sandhya Menon. Uh, she, of course, uh, part of the group uh, that, uh, that ga gave uh, uh, the Me Too movement momentum here in India. Uh, Sandhya, you know, uh, the, the Indian Women Press Corps putting out a statement saying that an impartial probe should be conducted into all the complaints without fear of threat or intimidation to the complainants, more so as the accused party is an influential minister in the present government. There is no conversation about even the possibility of a probe at this point in time. The point I'm trying to make is that the message that this sends out to the larger community, to the media organizations that are dealing with these cases, to corporate India uh, dealing with these cases, is that if a minister in the government chooses to stay on and the government doesn't act against its own minister, then why should others? Isn't that the larger message that's going out? <coughs> I 100% agree, Shireen. It's, it's really disappointing that the government has taken absolutely no stand. On the one hand, it seems like they've washed their hands off uh, Mr. Akbar. On the other hand, um, he, it seems like he has the backing of the government or his uh, party uh, to have the, to brazen it out and uh, file a suit against uh, Priya. But I do have something to say. Um, just today, the leaflet uh, has posted an interview with um, Maneka Gandhi where she says men will try and use intimidation tactics like defamation suits. We shouldn't step down. And mm. I think I'm going to, all of us are going to take her up on that and see that we don't step down. It's just ridiculous to intimidate like this. All right, let me get the two lawyers into this conversation, Sujay as well as Kamini Jaiswal with us. Sujay, let me come to you first. Uh, uh, you know, what do you make of this criminal defamation case? Because now this is, this yeah. is a matter that moves from social media, from newspaper headlines to the courtroom. How do you see this process moving forward from here? See, as a lawyer, I think it's a matter of immense interest because till today what we were seeing is, and I've taken part in the earlier debates, we saw a lot of women coming on TV and social media and saying that we don't want to take it further, we don't want to go to court, we don't want to follow the legal process, mm. but we want to shame these people, those other individuals uh, on social media. We want them to be ostracized. So that was the idea. But here is a case that has now mm. traveled into the court. And now it will be interesting to see as to how and on what basis this will pan out. So I agree with Sandhya over there because this is going to be a very yeah. important test case. And you see the Me Too movement has picked up momentum. Mm. You see, if this movement is regulated and if there are certain guidelines, I'm sure it will do a wealth of good. 
But we don't want a movement in this country because if a crime is committed, it has to be punished. I, there is a no nonsense and, 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 and a zero tolerance yeah. attitude to crimes against women and children. And I have stood up for that throughout. But we mm. don't want innocent people or men in high positions to be soft target. Yeah. Well, but let me get Kamini Jaiswal into the discussion as well. Uh, Ms. Jaiswal, now that a criminal defamation suit has been filed by MJ Akbar against Priya Ramani, who first made the allegations against him, how do you see this panning out? And also, you know, we've been hearing these stray comments from uh, uh, Minister Menika Gandhi saying that four retired judges, will, a committee of four retired judges will be set up. There could be the possibility of public hearings. It's been very, very sketchy. No details, no clarification, no clarity. But given the fact that Mr. Akbar is the one who's now uh, opted for legal recourse. He's moved the court first. How do you see this proceeding? Well, how do we see it proceeding? It will proceed in court. And why only Pierre Ramani? What about the other six people? Is he afraid to take them on? Why only one lady? Because there are six others who have said so. So you take them all on, no? Why do you no, want there to are more than six, ma'am. There's more than huh? six. There's, a, there's 14 altogether. There's 14 altogether. There's 14 women altogether. Okay, 14. I, I may be wrong, you know. I may be wrong on the numbers. But what I'm saying is if there are 14 altogether, why only one has he has taken? If he's filed defamation, why is it okay. only there should be others? Obviously, then by implication, others are speaking the truth. Then how can there be defamation of a person mm. who has uh, sexually assaulted 13 others? This is further sexual okay, harassment. It's further sexual harassment for him to continue to sit in office and, and file this criminal defamation case. But AKB, you know, I want to come back yes. to you uh, because uh, one of the issues raised by Mr. Akbar in his petition and in his statement uh, yeah. is that this is a political conspiracy. Uh, you know, this takes me back to what we saw uh, in the U.S. with the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. Uh, and there you had President Trump saying that the Democrats were trying to destroy a wonderful man. He was, of course, talking about Brett Kavanaugh. But never Nevertheless, Brett Kavanaugh had to go through the confirmation hearings. He had to sit through Ford making her statement in front of uh, uh, the Senate. He had to uh, respond. Uh, and uh, reluctantly, President Trump had to order an FBI investigation, post which he was confirmed. Uh, you know, do you, I mean, the kind of similarities uh, between what we're witnessing here in India and what we saw with Brett Kavanaugh are uh, eerily uh, similar. Well, it, yeah, I mean, in a, in a broad sense, similar, but there are also key differences I see. Um, one is uh, that uh, uh, this is not, a, you know, somebody's appointment issue, uh, but it is uh, something that he is yeah. accused to have been done, to have done when he was an editor of a newspaper or many newspapers. Uh, and two uh, is uh, that uh, he has filed this case as an individual. Now, as an individual, uh, he files this case and he, as I understand from the law, uh, as an individual, we are free to file a case against any individual out of 15 or 14 who you think you, you have been defamed by. So therefore, on, I think on strictly on legal grounds, yeah. probably he is, uh, is okay to have mm. filed the case against only one person. Uh, Kamini Jaiswal, you wanted to respond to uh, what you just heard there from Mr. Bhattacharya? No, no, I heard, yes, I heard him. He said it is his right to sue one person. I'm not saying that it is not his right to sue one person at a time. What I am saying is, how come if 14 people and some other allegations are much more serious than what Priyara, why has he just taken her on? Why does he not have the guts to take on all of them? Hmm. Because... That's a fair if, point, yeah. Okay. That's all I'm yeah, saying. I'm not point. saying that he cannot do it. He can do sure. it. He can take four, file 14 sure. different sure. fees. Everything is available yeah. to him. He has the wherewithal. He has the power. He has everything. But And to say that all this is politics, what rubbish is that? Why would the government not want to cut Mr. Akbar loose? Uh, to the point that Mr. Akbar, uh, the, the AKB made that this is now going to be heard in court. This is a minister who's going to be sitting in the witness box. Uh, why would the government choose not to say, OK, go on, leave till this matter sorted out? Uh, if you don't want to sack him.
uh, absolutely, Shireen, and it's not just the court. There is a court of public opinion. There's also a court of international public opinion that will be watching just how India, a country that prides itself on the international state, of adhering to uh, international level norms when it comes to uh, uh, human rights, when it comes to women's rights, certainly speaks up at all international fora, uh, is going to treat this uh, case of sexual harassment or accusations against a minister in the government. And this is why, you know, today four different uh, journalistic organizations have come together now and issued the first joint statement. And the, the crux of the joint statement is very simple. Statement, Let me yes has every right to defend himself against the accusations. But this is about sexual harassment in the workplace. Yes. This is setting a template, a benchmark for how we go forward, not just for ourselves, not just for our generation, but for our daughters, our sons, the next generation as well. And it is incumbent, it is propriety for the minister to step aside while an impartial probe is held against him. Because the fact remains that 14 women have come out. Some of them, uh, some of them, I should add, were 18 years old. They were just out of school when uh, uh, they say that Mr. Akbar carried out uh, acts of sexual harassment against them. I don't think the, any of these can be taken lightly. And without prejudging the case, I would say that it is impossible to run a probe while the accused remains in a position of utmost power, he's a member of the cabinet. Mr. Akbar has now chosen to move court uh, with that criminal defamation case, uh, but should uh, whether it is Priya Ramani, who will of course defend herself in this matter, or some of the other women uh, want to take legal recourse. What are the provisions of law that they can seek legal, legal recourse under? Because there are time limitations when it comes to the sexual harassment uh, law. There are time limitations to some of the other provisions as well. So under what legal provision can they seek recourse, Sujay? See, they can file an FIR with the police station, but the only difficulty is that uh, up to a certain time, now depends on the act of occurrence and which, uh, what was the exact point of occurrence, because the law was amended as far as 354, outraging the modesty of a woman, etc., yeah. all those offences. See, rape is stands on a different footing, but uh, what we are looking over here is basically 354. Yes, yes. Now, under the CRPC also, to a certain extent, there was a limitation prescribed at one point of time. So, uh, the women are not remedyless. A.K. Bharacharya, Sandhya Menon, Kamini Jaiswal, Suhasni Heather and uh, Sujay Kantawala. Appreciate you joining us here uh, this evening on CNBC TV 18. Thirty-six companies that are part of the Nifty 50 index have seen 588 complaints of sexual misconduct in FI18. Vipro has the highest number with over 100 complaints, followed by ICICI Bank, Infosys, TCS and Axis Bank. M. Saraswati, who broke the story for Money Control, joins us now. Saraswati, uh, take us through the data and also uh, if you can explain to our viewers how you've been able to compile this data. Shireen, you know, if you look at uh, the data that we took out from the Nifty 50 companies, predominantly it has been IT companies who are leading the list. You know, as you mentioned, Wipro is at 101. Then you have Vertices at 62 and Infosys at 77. Now, interestingly, it also reflects the kind of uh, women that these sectors employ. Of course, the IT sector is one of the largest employers of women, and it, this directly reflects in the number of complaints that have been filed in these companies. This data is from the business responsibility report that is part of the annual report of these companies. As per the Prevention of Sexual Harassment Act, all of these okay. complaints that have been filed under the POSH Act will have to be disclosed on an annual basis. So I've collated the data from there. Well, the data there from annual reports of companies, remember, under the law, companies have to make disclosures when it comes to complaints related to sexual harassment. Now, as cases of women commuters facing sexual assault in cabs continue to rise, the government is planning to bring in stricter norms to prevent these incidents. Sources tell CNBC TV 18 the road ministry is working on new guidelines for cab abrogators operating in India. Anu Sharma joins us now with more details. Anu, what are the new rules and by when are they likely to kick in? 
Well, with the usage of cabs increasing at a massive pace across the country, the Roads and Transport Ministry is working on an additional set of guidelines to make travelling safer for women. Sources have told CNBC TV 18 that new guidelines will recommend a more prominent SOS button on the app, driver training and sensitization exercise. Cab aggregators will also be advised to conduct periodic verification of the drivers to ensure better safety standards. Many of you must have seen that the SOS button on an app gets disabled once the ride is complete and there are chances of misuse by a cab driver. The Road Transport Ministry guidelines are likely to suggest that the SOS button is available even after the cab driver has ended a ride through the app. In addition, the new norms may also recommend disabling of the child lock system in the cabs and notify the passenger in case of an unscheduled detour. Officials also tell us that the cab aggregators are on board with this new idea and the notification for the new safety guidelines are likely to be released by the end of this month. The Commission of India is not probing online retailers over discounts. That's the word uh, coming in from the chairman of the Commission, Sudhir Mittal. Speaking to CNBC TV 18's uh, Yash Jain, Mittal said online discounts are not limited to dominant players and they are not probing any company at the moment. Discounts, uh, unless until the discounts of predatory pricing yes. to take on to discount and to exclude finally others, the Commission could proceed only if uh, the discounts or predatory pricing is being done by a dominant party. Okay. Now, till such time as that is proved that mm. the party is dominant, the Act doesn't provide that you can proceed against them. So, discounts per se, the Commission will not uh, move into unless until the Commission first determines that the party is dominant in the relevant market and then is giving uh, discounts to exclude others and then finally uh, gain the entire, once, once you gain the market then so at, at this point of time, as this point of time, there is no case which really goes against the online players. Uh, looking at the conditions which we have. Yes, as of now, as of now, none, but well, you never know. On to another CNBC TV 18 exclusive. We learn from sources that ahead of the ASEAN summit, India is under pressure from all 16 nations which are a party to the negotiations for RCEP or Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And the pressure is to commit to higher duty cuts. And this is definitely not in India's favour. The RCEP nations have asked India to cut duties across sectors like textile, machinery parts, steel, chemicals. Rituparna Bhuyan is here with the details. Ritu, how is India likely to respond? RCEP or a Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, is the biggest FTA under consultation and negotiation at the moment. Uh, there is a group of 16 countries which is doing this and it, this includes India, China as well as the whole of ASEAN and also includes Australia and New Zealand and Japan and South Korea. Now according to our sources, uh, India is under great pressure to commit to uh, the duty cuts uh, uh, of, a, of a big uh, large number of products that it uh, trades with these nations uh, according to uh, uh, our sources as far as China, New Zealand uh, and Australia is concerned. Uh, the demand is that India should, uh, you know, uh, cut uh, uh, around 80% of the of the goods that it trades uh, at zero duty. Of course, uh, this uh, zero duty uh, trade will happen uh, in a in, in a fa in a phased manner, and the time period that has been given to India is 20 years. For ASEAN, the demand is that uh, India should bring uh, around 90% of its goods that it trades with ASEAN to zero duty uh, within this 20-year period. Uh, now, uh, this uh, free trade agreement uh, will. Uh, come under discussion uh, during the ASEAN conference uh, which will be attended by uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and this will happen in November and it, and it remains to be seen if Indian negotiators are able to get a you know, a good deal uh, for Indian, um, in Indian exporters uh, in, in, this, uh, in this free trade agreement. With that, uh, it's back to you. The latest in the INFS uh, fiasco now, the National Company Law Appellate Tribunal has stayed all proceedings against INFS and its 348 subsidiaries until further orders. The decision comes after the NCLT rejected a plea by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs which sought a 90-day prohibition on loans given to INFS and its subsidiaries. Ashmit Kumar, who has been tracking the story, now joins us with the details. That's a big relief coming in for Ireland FS as well as for the government. Uh, the NCLAT passing what appears to be a moratorium, as in no cases uh, or claims can be filed against Ireland FS or its subsidiaries, 348 of them. Uh, now, here are the key takeaways. Uh, as far as the Ireland FS new board is concerned and the government, they had moved NCLT Mumbai. Their prayer was quite clear that there should be a blanket stay on any proceedings that can be launched against Ireland FS. Their argument, their reasoning essentially was that they have only just recently taken charge, that up until uh, recently, uh, the number of subsidiaries was pegged at once. 
169. It appears now that there are 348, that the government needs to take stock in that minus such a protection. They could be fighting as many as 70 to 80 cases across various forums. Now, the NCLT had refused such a blanket order, saying that it cannot pass uh, such blanket protection, cannot be given to the RNFS board. And on the back of that, both the RNFS board on one hand and the government on the other had moved the NCLAT. Now, this morning, the case was heard. The NCLAT has passed a four-part order. Number one, it's agreed to hear the case. Number two, it has issued a notice to all the respondents. Number three, it has also pleaded the five of the largest creditors as far as RNFS and its subsidiaries are concerned. But the fourth is perhaps the most critical aspect that as of right now, a stay has been granted by NCLAT. No cases or claims can be filed against RNFS or its 348 subsidiaries in any of the NCLTs as of right now. So a moratorium essentially coming into effect. It will re remain in effect until the next date of hearing, the next uh, case, uh, the next hearing uh, or in this case will be held on November 13th. Back to you. All right, uh, let's get you more now. You can't have a one-size-fits-all uh, approach for Ireland FS. It will require a multi-pronged strategy. That's a word coming in from the Corporate Affairs Secretary who welcomed the NCLAT order, saying that the RLFS board has been duly empowered. Listen in. You can't have a one-size-fits-all type of uh, uh, problem right. resolution. Right. So it will be a, a multi-pronged uh, resolution. One doesn't envisage a turnaround for the group as such. Right. But uh, you'll have to break, down, break it down into parts. Right. And part by part, you'll have to find the resolution. Okay. It is quite possible that some of the uh, units of ILFS uh, uh, can actually be sold as going concerns, okay. but that may be a few. Okay. In many cases, it could be an asset sale. In some cases, it could be a slump sale. Right. And in some cases, it could be just winding up. In the GST corner, a group of ministers set up to examine the modalities for revenue mobilization in case of natural calamities or disasters met for the first time. The panel discussed whether there should be a cess under GST in addition to the existing funding mechanism for such scenarios. Uh, remember, this was first discussed uh, during the Kerala floods. The group of ministers will meet again in November. Here's what the convener of the panel and Bihar's Deputy Chief Minister Sushil Modi had to say. And the members felt that SDRF and NDRF is not sufficient to compensate to the states. This calamity tax should be state-specific or it should be a union tax. Or, uh, uh, and it should be levied on all the, uh, all the commodities or, should, or it should be a specific commodities, this kind of tax should be levied. In Sari Chujanki Barami Prarambik Vichar Kyol Hua hai. From the GST corner to the electric vehicle space. Taiwan's largest two wheeler maker, Kimco, which is also the fourth largest scooter maker in the world, has made its official entry into India today. The company has tied up with Gurugram based electric mobility startup 22 Motors for this venture. The company will be entering India not just with electric scooters, but as a turnkey solutions provider for electric infrastructure. This will include charging stations for batteries where users just need to swap batteries in the vehicles with charged batteries from the station. Kimco chairman. Alan Koh spoke to CNBC TV 18's Arif Shirvani. He said the company expects to sell at least half a million scooters in India in the first three years of business. Listen in. Yes, I think uh, people are waiting for the right electric scooters to be in the market. And that's exactly what we are going to bring to the market. So uh, uh, actually, we have a, a, a target of uh, half a million scooters in the next three years, electric scooters. So. Um, of course, uh, it, it does seem like a big number today, but I do think that if you consider the, the total market of maybe 25 million right. school, uh, uh, units uh, in the next two years, then actually it's still a very small penetration rate. And I do think that that's a very uh, achievable target for us. Of course, the government has yet to come up with a comprehensive auto policy as promised during the mobility summit organized by the Niti Aayog. On to another CNBC TV 18 exclusive. Sources tell us that public sector banks are planning to write to the finance ministry on cross-selling commissions. Yash Jain joins us with the details. Yash, what are the concerns that the public sector banks are likely to raise in the days to come? 
before I get to the latest development, let me just uh, put a few things in context. So what is cross-selling of products? Essentially what that means is that uh, any employee of a particular bank is selling the products of the bank's subsidiaries. For example, a state bank of India uh, employs selling uh, mutual fund products of SBI mutual fund or life and general insurance products of SBI life and SBI general. Now, what uh, we were given to understand also this uh, came a couple of weeks ago is that finance ministry had expressed uh, concern with respect to mis-selling of these products and asked PSU banks to stop paying commission to their employees for cross-selling of products. Now, uh, what we are given to understand is that these PSU banks beat uh, Punjab National Bank, State Bank of India, Bank Bank of Baroda are planning to write to the finance ministry to defend the, 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 the cross-selling medium or the bank assurance medium saying that these uh, lines of business are very important for the subsidiary for distributing their products be it the life general insurance business or the mutual fund business. What they're essentially uh, trying to protect the ground they're saying that you know even though uh, the product is being sold by the employee of the bank there is a lot of due diligence which happens on uh, the subsidiary's end which is the mutual fund or the insurance company where they do a need analysis and various other things to make sure that the customer knows about what he's buying so there is no sort of cross uh, uh, mis-selling which happens from the banks. Also what they're saying is that the government needs to make a clear differentiation when it comes to banks which are performing as far as their core banking operations are concerned and the banks which are not and then accordingly put restriction when it comes to cross-selling. But yes, it is a, a, a very big overhang because if you just look at uh, some of the businesses PNB MetLife, the life insurance company, gets 52% of its business through bank assurance. IDBI Federal Life gets 80%. SBI Life, 60%. India First, which has Bank of Baroda as its partner, gets 85 to 90%. So it is a big overhang. And we'll have to see how the finance ministry really assesses the response from these PSU banks. All right. Uh, thanks, Yash, for joining us with that exclusive report. The next time you want to head to Goa for a vacation, remember you can even sail there from Mumbai and that too in style. CNBC TV18's Ashwini Priyolkar actually jumped on board India's first domestic passenger cruise liner that brings to life a travel route which has not been available in India for over 30 years. Come October 20th and you will be able to sail to your favourite holiday destination Goa from Mumbai. Angria is India's first passenger cruise liner. The ship is designed in such a way that your holiday will begin with your journey. The distance from Mumbai to Goa will be covered in 15 hours. Well, I'm really excited to check this ship out. Here is my boarding pass and the boat that will take me to the ship. So come join me. Kanhoji Angre, the first admiral of the Maratha Navy, the Angria is a 131-meter luxury cruise ship featuring five decks. The 20-year-old vessel is of Japanese origin and has been modified to add luxury elements to the 15-hour cruise between Mumbai and Goa. We located a beautiful ship in Japan which was doing across Pacific. She was operating between Tokyo and uh, Ogaswara Islands into open Pacific. So we found that this is one of the best sizes suited for this and the, the size was just suitable. The passenger capacity though was 1,200. We have now reduced it to 400 to make it more luxury. We have added a complete West Coast flavor. Amenities on board include three open decks, an infinity swimming pool, a reading room, an underwater spa, two multi-cuisine restaurants and six bars. Passengers can also check into eight kinds of cabins with ticket prices ranging from 7,500 rupees to 12,000 rupees one way depending on the deck and the kind of cabin chosen. The cruise will begin from Mumbai Port Trust's Purple Gate at Indira Dock and in Goa, the vessel will dock at Murmuga Port. MBPT says it has plans to build more such docks as cruise tourism picks up. In cruise tourism what happens is when these passengers come here, they go all over the city, they visit the places and they spend much more than what they are even spending in the cruise tourism and the city benefits. So suppose all these people start coming here, 
then I will not even not only have one berth for it, four or five berths like Miami will have to be for this purpose. And this port will mainly become a cruise tourism port. Angria Sea Eagle, which has launched this cruise with support from the Mumbai Port Trust, says Angria's maiden voyage will begin from Mumbai at 5 pm on the 20th of October and reach Goa at 9 am on the 21st of October. So the next time you head to Goa, you may want to brush up on your sea shanty and learn to tell the difference between the port side and the starboard side. In Mumbai with Ashwini Priyolkar, Farah Bukwala Bora. Ashwini there telling us that now you can sail to Goa and that too in full luxury. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business Hour. Thank you for watching. Good night.